I'm sorry that you're all here on a false expectation because <laughs> dinner speeches are supposed to be light and funny and Jack Halliday invited an economist. Um, so I've got lots of bad news for you. Um, we'll go through it. Some of it I'll try and, um, and put as nice a gloss on it as I can, but I guess it's my nature to try and pick holes in the dominant paradigm. And in economics, the dominant paradigm is that Australia has come through the GFC without a recession. Okay. Yay, yep. Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit oversized. Uh, <laughs> and that you know, we alone of the developing world have sort of gone 25 years without a recession and things are, growth is good, job growth is good, and things are, are pretty hunky-dory. And, but I think some of these issues I'm, I'm going to raise with you are important. Uh, and they matter to people who aren't economists because they shape our horizons, they shape what we can do and can't do in the areas of our own concern. And when Jack rang me, I'd just come back from Italy and uh, that was quite alarming, uh, having six weeks in Italy, and which I used to live in long ago, and seeing how things have deteriorated there in terms of the social cohesion of the country and uh, the economic prospects of its young people. Um, Italy is probably the first Western country that is looking like sliding out of the ranks of developed Western countries in relative terms. It's had 20 years now of virtually no growth at all in per capita output and incomes. It's got 11.3% of its workforce unemployed. In other countries we've had like in Australia, for example, we've had a, a big expansion of female employment, of employment of older people. In Italy, they haven't had much of that at all, very little. It's still a much more, one of the things that really struck me was it's just a much more sexist country than this one is. And uh, it's still a country where your horizons are limited according to where you come from and uh, uh, who you are, what sort of gender you are and so on. And if you looked at Italy now, its politics is splintered into three totally unreconcilable groups. One, the right wing, which itself is three groups who find it hard to reconcile. You've got the socialists in the centre left, um, who are kind of more or less like the Labour Party here. Uh, and then you've got a, a sort of splinter group off from them, there's about 10% of Italians would like to see a government that was of the further left. Um, and then you've got the Grillini, as they're called, uh, Beppe, Be Beppo Grillo, and the comedian who set up his own party. And uh, that's sort of a bit like the Greens, um, but it's much bigger and uh, much more populist and much less sensible, frankly, than the Greens, uh, and more extreme and doesn't agree with anybody, any other party on anything. And uh, Italy's just ungovernable and how you get a majority for any kind of reforms to improve its um, horizons, I really couldn't see from, from the time I spent there. So I came back rather depressed and this is when Jack rang me and I kind of had this in my head. And, um, and that's the theme I decided to talk about tonight, which is very inconsiderate of me since you're here to have fun. Um, sorry, if you want to walk out uh, at any time, <laughs> Feel free if I'm just too negative. Um, ah, now this is, presumably I can get rid of that. Oh. No, we'll get this onto your... <laughs> the social media is catching up. Ah, right. okay. Anyway. Um, let's just jump straight to the slide since uh, time is short. What is some of the things I want to focus on that uh, worry me about Australia today? The first one is the jobs market. And people, when they look at the overall numbers, they say, oh, yes, jobs growth is, is booming. And I've got to say, if you're my age, jobs growth, the jobs market's terrific. There's something like one third of guys aged 65 to 69 are now still in work, which wasn't the case, of course, 
um, any time in the past. And uh, women, likewise, there's, there's been a huge increase in employment at the older spectrum. But for 15 to 20 year olds, we've had an increase of 310,000. Everyone can see those figures? Is they, they clear at the back? Shall I read them out? Okay, I've got some old friends there at sort of one of the back tables who are probably sort of strange. Um, this is 10 years, last 10 years, the number of 15 to 24 year olds in Australia has grown by 310,000. The number of them in a full time job has fallen by 190,000. So there's 500,000 fewer young people in full time jobs. Now, a lot of them are studying, which is great, but uh, a lot of them, as you can see, are either working part time by choice, there's 62,000 of them. Underemployed, 140,000 people are working part-time but would like to be working full-time, basically. 84,000 more are unemployed. And 214,000 more are not in the labour force and hopefully they are studying. Um, I suspect a lot of them are not studying. But that's, uh, it's, a, it's a very grim environment for young people in the jobs market at the moment. And that hasn't changed a great deal in the years since the GFC. This has got worse. Oops. You want the next one? Whoa, no, that's a long way. <laughs> that's at the other end of the speech. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, that one, previous one we just had. She two. She two. She two, that's right. She two. All right. Um, yeah, and now this is the most indecent thing I have to say tonight. It's sort of every time I tell anybody it feels like I've just farted in church. But uh, the job, the full-time jobs, where are they going? They're not going to the Australian born by and large. In the eight years to last year, the Australian born added 74,000 jobs. That's a bit over 9,000 jobs a year for all the people born in Australia. Extra jobs. I mean, that's just the increase. Um, if you were born overseas, um, the vast bulk of them went to people who were born overseas. Now, not people who've been here for a long time, not the old migrants, but people who've come in recent years. And if you look at how the workforce is actually operating, the role played by labour hire companies, the role played by Section 457 visas, the way in which, for example, the NBN just contracts out to Infosys, and they bring their entire workforce from India. It's, it's in the old age office, well not the old age office, but the current, <laughs> what was until recently part of the age office in uh, opposite Southern Cross Station. Um, I stood there one night and there was just this endless stream of Indian people coming out. And it turned out that that was the NBN office and virtually the entire workforce of the NBN office is Indian. Now I've got no objection to you giving Indians jobs, but this is Australia and we have Australians who want work in IT and we are not providing the opportunities for them. Young Australians who want a starting job, um, want to build their own careers, uh, not getting opportunities because of the way we are organising the outsourcing, the ease of hiring people from abroad and bringing them here without having to train them and people are not getting enough training, our young people are not getting enough training, they do not have enough doors open to them to fulfil their careers. And this is to me a really serious problem that, that is not getting enough airplay in politics. Um, if I just to finish this bit, I said the number of Australian born who, the uh, number of increased jobs for the Australian born in the last eight years was 74,000, the number of increased full-time jobs for Indian-born people and other people from South Asia was 156,000 or something like that. It was uh, more than twice the number, which is bizarre. This is, um, we do have to look after our own. Um, sheet three? Oh, oh, sorry, that's 20th century migrants and 21st century migrants, so people it's, a cent it's actually people who came after 2001 and people who came before 2001. 
sorry. Um, and our growth per head over the decade is um, we have not had a recession, according to uh, according to the experts, and according sorry, not according to the experts, uh, according to the Reserve Bank, for example. Uh, we didn't have a recession in 2008 and 9 because we didn't have two consecutive quarters in which GDP fell. On the other hand, we did have 400,000 people become unemployed and underemployed, and uh, national income per head did crash by 6%, but um, they say uh, that's not a recession. Well, we've had the lowest growth in the last decade that we have ever had since the Australian Bureau of Statistics was created in 1949. And uh, it's been even lower than it was in those decades where we had two recessions. Um, a real problem. And what makes it worse is that we're one of the better performers in the Western world. If you look at Europe, even the United States, Japan, uh, there's not many countries that have done better than us. There are some, but not many. And yet, you compare it to the past, growth per head is now about less than 1%. It used to be 3% during the long boom, 2% during the sort of 80s, 90s, noughties. Um, this is a serious fall in our potential to achieve other things, and particularly to achieve all those things that we like to be funded by growth. And um, I'm sure race remembers what it's like to go into government, assuming that you'll have five or six percent growth and then not quite achieve it. <laughs> um, so if you take, if we go on to the next slide. So this is the astonishing changes that are happening in the world economy in the last decade. If you take the Western world in general, you're seeing growth has been slow, sort of, 7% per head over the last decade. That's so it's less than 1% a year, like as in Australia. Um, and pretty much the same in Europe, Japan, Australia, not much different. Look at China, India and Indonesia, the developing world. Terrific story there, and I'm glad for them. Um, they're having very rapid growth, particularly China, but now India are also taking over. Uh, and this figure is interesting, the last column, 83% of all the growth in global output in the last decade has been in developing countries and only 17% in the Western world. Um, next. Okay, we had the GFC in the last five years. If we move on, should it be better in the next few years? It's a little better, yeah, because this time we got 7% growth in five years, not 10. Uh, but it's the same story. Basically, they're expecting the IMF, these are the IMF forecasts, International Monetary Fund, and they're expecting the Western world to grow on average by 1.7% a year. Uh, so very slow growth ahead for the Western world. And that's as far ahead as they can see. It doesn't change as they go out. India alone is expected to generate as much extra production of goods and services in the next five years as the entire Western world, which comprises Europe, the United States, Australia, Japan, uh, more than, more than uh, a billion people in all. It's a huge change to our sense of what matters in the world, where growth is coming, what our potential is. Um, if we move on to the next one, I've got so much gloom in this story. <laughs> this is the change in the shares of global output. And if you can't see them from the back, China has gone from 11.3% a decade ago of the world, of world's output to 20.5% in 2022. At least that's the estimate. It's now 18. Um, Europe and, Euro and the USA in 2007 had produced about twice as much as China and India combined. Uh, by 2022, just 15 years later, China and India will be producing more than Europe and the United States. Big change. 
uh, Indonesia will be on the cusp of overtaking Germany as an economy. Um, of course, they'll still be much poorer than us, and you know, don't, we should never forget that. In the 20, 2022, the IMF projects the real output per head in China and India, uh, sorry, in China, will be not quite 25% of output in the US per head. India, Indonesia, a tad under 25%, India, 15%. But as long as it is cheaper to produce goods there than here, talking about water, um, as long as global growth is concentrated there and infrastructure is making trade more viable and foreign investment is welcome, then investment will flow there as naturally as water flows to the lowest ground. And the capacity to make manufactured goods at increasingly sophisticated levels will shift from Western countries which have high wages to countries which have lower wages and are capable of making the same quality goods or something like the same quality goods. I'm, I'm still be reluctant to fly on a Chinese airplane if, uh, if a German or American one is available. But um, one last graphic. Actually, it's not the last, it's the third last. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is the... Last week, the government published a white paper on foreign policy and I strongly recommend anybody remotely interested in, uh, in foreign policy to read it, in global politics. Its real topic was the rise of China. India, at least nominally, was given a starring role because they called our region the Indo-Pacific, which I must admit jarred every time I read it. But it's really about China and the United States. And its key messages are to warn that China is on track to become the dominant power in the region, unless it's checked. Its, its other key message was to urge the United States to return to a globalist foreign policy and not the America first policies that Trump is following. Of course, it was far too polite to say, make any mention of President Trump. And it also had a message to Australian exporters to tell them, these are the markets you need to be selling to. Um, well, the panel tells the story. Remember that at the turn of the century, the United States economy was roughly three times the size of the Chinese economy. And yet, just 15 years later, China had overtaken the US. It's now 20% bigger. By 2030, DFAT estimates, it'll be almost twice the size of the United States economy. China will be almost twice the size of the United States economy. That has huge implications for political power, military power. Um, it's a different world. Um, in 1999, the US economy was five times the size of India's economy. Once you adjust all these figures that I've been quoting are on what's called purchasing power parity basis, which means basically you adjust the different price, uh, prices and costs in the different countries. So that you're comparing output rather than prices. Today, the US is about twice India's size. By 2030, as those figures show you, India will have almost caught up to the US, and within that decade it will overtake the US and then set out to overtake China. Um, we're going to have a decade, we're going to have perhaps 30, 40 years when China is the dominant power in our region and in the world. And it's going to be, I'm no foreign policy expert, Bruce Grant's sitting there, if you've got questions on foreign policy, Bruce, I'm sure we'll be happy to take them. Uh, but uh, it, it does raise huge issues in my mind as to how we will settle and solve global events. Um, I won't get into a discussion of the white paper here, but I'll just say that I have problems with both the uh, federal government's policy of trying to contain China and with Labor's approach, which seems to be a kind of trust China approach. But I do think it's a hugely important issue and the more good minds like those in this room are focused on it, uh, the better the chance that we will make the right choices. And second, uh, the one thing I will say is I think it's very important that we understand China through the prism of Chinese history and not our own. We don't like the face that it presents in its determinedly authoritarian regime, the way it suppresses free speech, self-determination in places like Tibet, 
Its approach to foreign policy in the South China Sea could be summed up in three words as might makes right. Or as Thucydides put it so eloquently, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. We're seeing people adjust to that in Asia. It's traditional. China used to send, years, centuries ago, China would send out boats to Southeast Asia to uh, ships would come to their ports and demand a tribute for the emperor. And um, the regimes on Java and in the Philippines and Vietnam would send off some money and uh, hope that would be the end of it. And it usually was. Um, but they do expect weaker states to accommodate their wishes, as President Duterte is doing in the Philippines and as the Vietnamese, I'm, I'm told, have done recently. What worries me is it will probably expect the same of us. In fact, you can see that in the way it's responded to things like the white paper or anything we have to say. And it's not in our tradition to bow to a might makes right approach. I would like to see people as omniscient as Paul Keating tell us how we should handle that one. Let me move on. Um, what has driven the dramatic shift in the engines of growth to the developing world is above all the shift of manufacturing to those countries. In 1990, China's manufacturing exports to the world were valued at 44 billion US dollars, which was about six times the value of what we sold to the rest of the world. By 2015, remember they were 44 billion, they'd gone to 2,144 billion making China the factory of the world by a very big margin. In Australia, lots of economic theorists tell us manufacturing doesn't matter. I doubt that you hear that said very often in China. It couldn't have recorded such rapid economic development had it not set out to become the workshop of the world. And now it's there, it knows it has to focus on developing more complex manufacturing because the simple stuff's already moving on to Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, lower wage countries. It's that process. Water will find the lowest land to, to fl flow down and capital will find cheapest place in which to produce things. It's a classic process of economic development and it's a great thing for the countries gaining the factories and it's a great thing for humanity as a whole. I'm all in favour of it. But never before in human history have we seen what has happened when countries give up large swathes of their manufacturing industry? It's not just Australia. We, we are at the extreme end of it, but it is a, a thing that's happened through a lot of Europe, not all of it. Germany has maintained, in particular, has maintained a very strong manufacturing industry. Korea has thrived. Um, but we've now seen it, and I think any honest economist would have to admit from the last 20, 25 years, it doesn't work that well. We were told that we could give up manufacturing jobs, it didn't matter, there'd be other jobs just as good. Paul Keating has a fantasy world in which he constantly tells us that he liberated the factory workers from the chains of their production lines to free them to do more creative, interesting and better paid work elsewhere. In Australia, in the real world, study after study found that roughly one third of workers laid off when factories closed did indeed find good jobs roughly similar quality and pay to the ones they'd lost. About a third had to settle for poorer paid jobs, usually part-time and often insecure, significant falling living standards. And about a third of them never worked again. Usually workers aged 45 and over who ran into the usual discrimination against older workers. We seem to have moved into a culture now where employers are happy to keep on older workers. The age didn't want me to go when I hit 65. <laughs> Um, but they won't hire them. <laughs> and uh, so the people who were laid off over 45 couldn't get another job. They saw their working lives ended permanently and prematurely, often at a substantial financial cost. That's the reality. Um, and the slow growth of today is partly the result of that economic restructuring 30 years ago. Certainly there's been growth in high wage jobs, finance sector. More powerful, better paid than ever before, bigger than ever. Uh, there are infinitely more jobs in the professions, and there are new professions that didn't exist 30 years ago. But there has been an impermanency in work, lack of job openings for the young, and for too many people, only part-time work available. 
This is particularly true in the country. Um, an astonishing figure, I, even to me. Uh, and I, uh, as you can tell, I'm a lover of bad news. Um, but God almighty, in the last 10 years, Melbourne has added 263,000 new full-time jobs. The rest of Victoria has added 9,000. Uh, in New South Wales, Sydney's added 236,000 new full-time jobs. The rest of the state, 31,000. We've become, the options outside the big cities uh, are very poor. And that's one of the reasons why young people are having to move to the cities, even with all the housing costs that involves. Um, and I think there's one last panel. I mean, we have kept growing, as I said. We have done better than most other Western countries, but only slightly better. And one of the reasons we've grown better than other countries is that we had a lot of minerals to sell. And the other big one, in my view, is that we have taken on a hell of a lot of debt. Uh, in the past 25 years, household debt and the other liabilities have grown much faster than our incomes. 1992, household debt was 73% of our income. Now, it's 194%. That's a hell of a growth. Virtually all of that is the result of a growth in housing debt, from 36% of household income 25 years ago to 136% now. No one can seriously argue that that is going to continue. And when it stops, growth will slow. This is exactly what happened in Italy. Part of the reason Italy had its boom years, the government kept borrowing. It was a joke, a national joke, that the government was always running deficits. Even in uh, years before it started to, it turned. It was, which were reasonably good years for Italy. You know, in northern Italy, there are lots of employers trying desperately to recruit labour from wherever because of the, the shortage of workers. Um, but the government was running deficits of 10% of GDP. Um, that had to end, and when it did end, Italy, Italy's growth more or less ended with it. Um, I tried to dig up some data from more distant times on household liabilities, and the best I could do was to discover that in 1962, our combined household incomes were roughly equi equivalent to 10% of GDP and now they're $2.4 trillion, about 140 to 150% of GDP. It's an extraordinary transformation. We used to be, in financial terms, we used to be lean, tall types. Now we have become financially obese. It's dangerous. We know that booms lead to busts. We can't say when, we can't say how, but at some point this housing boom will end and go into reverse. Prices will fall, Speculators will lose confidence in future gains, put their rental homes on the market, prices will then fall further, and so on. It'll be an extraordinarily hard transformation for the Reserve Bank and the government to manage, and the Reserve Bank has not helped itself by uh, being ridiculously quick to cut interest rates, uh, which are well below where they ought to be if it wants to have an ability to stop future um, disasters. Every global economic institution, the IMF, the OECD, think tank that looks at Australia, sees this as the great risk facing our economy. Well, one of the two great risks, the other one, of course, is the risk that China will go bust, because China has had an even greater explosion of debt. And if there's one thing you can say for Australian banks, they know how to make safe loans. They do pick their borrowers carefully. In China, borrowers, the loans go to the people with political influence and whether they can pay them back is a lesser factor. So that the potential um, for things to go wrong in China is, is particularly high. But the, so China and the housing bubble is the big danger facing Australia. It could well plunge us into recession and as we've seen in the global financial crisis, Recessions caused by falling asset values tend to do a lot of damage. We know how it happened. The surge in debt was driven by housing prices, which was driven by a combination of negative gearing, in some cases housing shortages, and in recent times, the high immigration. 
Um, the hawke keating government's got something to answer for there too. Uh, I think the social consequences of restoring negative gearing in 1987 have to rank among the worst of any government decision in my lifetime. So I'm very delighted that Bill Shorten and Chris Bowen have had the courage to finally rule the line under this tax break. And I hope that over time they also act to limit the de deductions for existing landlords because what Labor's proposed, of course, is to rule the line, grandfather everything that's been done up to now and then say no new negative gearing. Um, but people will still be able to claim tax breaks on properties they already own and I hope that Labor will also act to limit deductions for existing landlords such as Senator Barry O'Sullivan, who the National Party Senator has 50 negatively geared rental investment properties. <laughs> now, I have given you a fun speech, haven't I? You know, that no one's walked out. I'm, I'm really glad. So you've, you've enjoyed. <laughs> You're a bunch of masochists. <laughs> um, but look, I've got to finish. But of course, you want to know how to set things right. And if you ask me, I, I honestly don't know. I felt that in Italy. When I was young, I used to know the answer to every problem. But I was much cleverer then. And as I got older, I'm the less sure I am about knowing the answers to anything. Uh, so I had to call on my friends for help. And um, Dr. Pangloss agreed to convene a meeting of the <laughs> Economist Club and uh, to come up with the answers. And he said, look, Tim, there's no problem. We've got the company tax cuts are starting to come into legislation and they will generate new growth in our society. The government is providing infrastructure to liberal run states. And if more, more states vote for the coalition, then there'll be more infrastructure built um, and this will help to generate further growth. We have low interest rates and we're developing the north. So, Australia's future is rosies, said Dr Pangloss. Grad Grind agreed with the company tax cuts but said they were nowhere near big enough and nor were the tax cuts for rich people big enough. Uh, he wanted to abandon any climate policy and uh, prevent spending another dollar on um, trying to make the, prevent coal uh, heating up the atmosphere. And he wanted, above all, to bring back work choices. And I think he, he was going to say a bit more, but at that point, um, Hanrahan grabbed him and strangled him. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, look, mate, it's too late. We're ruined. <laughs> and I was telling you for 20 years what we needed to do, and you took no notice, and governments took no notice, and stuff you. It's all gone. We're ruined. And Levin said, well, a lot of it is ruined, but uh, there are some things you could do. And Lim said, two things to concentrate on. One is the housing problem and uh, making sure that Labor in government fulfills what it pledged to do in terms of ending new breaks for negative gearing or breaks for new negative gearing and also making it easier for renters. Um, reducing housing costs and getting people to accept the idea that higher housing costs are not a good thing, higher housing prices are not a good thing, and lower housing prices are actually in the interests of the country and in the interests of the young people who are our future. And secondly, Kevin said, uh, we need to focus a lot more on uh, getting economic growth. Economic. I sometimes see politics, I mean, there's many people here from many specialties and, and trades and occupations and professions, but I often tend to see the economic, or sorry, the policy battleground as being a battle between economists and lawyers, between people whose focus is on rights, which I'm all in favour of in their place, <laughs> and looking after the economic interests of families and the poor in particular, those who are, are not those who need government to, to help them. And I think we've tended to sometimes take our eye off the second and put more emphasis on the, third, on the, the rights issue. I mean, I, 
Um, I don't live in Melbourne anymore, so I'm probably a little taking life into my own, taking my life in my hands when I criticise the, the state government. But it's, it does seem to me that it is focused very much on rights and not very much on economic growth. And I'm sure that the Brax government and the Brumby government, the idea of having a ban on drilling for gas, even conventional drilling for gas, at a time when businesses here in Melbourne are on the brink, really on the brink. Big businesses who employ lots of workers are on the brink because of high gas prices. To have a ban on gas exploration is um, just warped values, seriously warped values. You, some people won't agree, that's all right. I'm all in favour of, uh, of having debate on issues, but um, the, these are th jobs that matter and growth matters. Um, and the other thing that Levin wanted to say was that uh, we should also push on with economic reforms where we can find good things to do, that we can build a constituency for and argue the case for without having to make too many apologies. All right. Um, I told you I was going to make you gloomy. I told you I was going to make you depressed. Um, I hope you have got something there to take home. There's particularly the implications of the rise of China, I think, are, are very large, and India, and Indonesia, which will be the fourth biggest economy in the world within about 25 years. Um, these are things that we need to think about because they're going to affect our future.